Do you feel like you're spending hours each week studying, but the content is just not sticking? Do you find that there's way too many new words to remember when it comes to anatomy and medical terminology? It's almost like learning a whole new language. And on top of that, there is just way too much in the way of volume that you need to learn every week. It's almost like drinking water out of a fire hose. On top of that, in medical school, content is cumulative. So what that means is it's not just good enough to memorize or remember the content for the exam, but you have to actually find ways to remember it in third year, in your clinical years, and in your profession as future doctors. The goal of studying and learning new content in the medical program is to ensure long-term retention. For getting information in this profession can have detrimental consequences. It is considered to be high stakes, which means that if you're forgetting a piece of information, yes, it may result in a lower exam score, but what is more important is the effect that that can have on your future patient's safety. My name is Dr. Nikki and welcome to my YouTube channel. In this particular episode, as an anatomist, I want to share my top five tips to help you to remember content quicker, but ultimately longer, using some of the underlying principles of the neuroscience of learning and how your memory works. We firstly need to think about what is memory and what are the main components as well as the anatomical elements associated with our memory. Firstly, if you're thinking about our everyday interactions, we are constantly exposed to a variety of stimuli, whether that is visual, auditory, olfactory. Everything that we see, we hear, we touch, we feel is considered to be sensory stimuli. When our mind recognizes the sensory stimuli, it is held in our brains for approximately one second. And this is referred to as our sensory memory. If we don't focus on the incoming stimuli, our mind is just going to discard this. However, if we had to pay attention to the sound of the air conditioning, for instance, our minds focusing in on that stimuli is then going to transfer the information from our sensory memory then to our short-term memory. Information in our short-term memory can only be held for a maximum of 30 seconds if we don't practice or rehearse that information. So an example of this that is used is if you're trying to remember the digits of a phone number or of a new password. If you're then constantly repeating the digits in your head, this is the process of repetition or rehearsal, and it's then transferred from your short-term memory into our working memory. And the working memory is then going to involve various components of our senses, of our executive function, to then try or to aim to move the information from our working memory, ultimately to our long-term memory. So if we're thinking about the processes associated with memory or the overall aims, aim one is to encode the information so that it sticks. Aim two is then to store and to store that information very strongly in the long-term memory. And we can do this through different types of processing. So this is where shallow processing or deep processing come into play. Our long-term memory is then divided up into two main groups. So we have our declarative or our explicit memory, and this is where we remember facts and events. And then we also have our non-declarative or our implicit memory, where we remember skills. The third aim is for us to be able to quickly retrieve information that is stored in the long-term memory centers so that when you're writing that exam, you can quickly pull the information or you're able to pull the information in your internship years of that tiny little muscle that a patient has lacerated on the plantar surface of their foot. So ultimately, the three steps is to encode, to store and to retrieve. So the first strategy that we can use to successfully encode information into our memory centers is spaced and paced learning or repetition or distributed practice. 
As I'm sure many of your educators have already explained to you, cramming in anatomy just does not work. Cramming may result in a higher exam score initially, but ultimately it's going to result in a decrease in your long-term retention of that information, which as I mentioned before, is the ultimate goal of your medical studies. For us to fully appreciate what is spaced and paced learning or repetition, we need to first understand a really important psychology model that is the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. The Ebbinghaus forgetting curve is a plot that shows us the amount of information our brains can retain versus the time lapse of when that content has been learnt or first delivered. The good news is that we can actually remember more or flatten the curve if you had to space your study or your revision or your testing. So what I tend to encourage in my students is you spend 20 minutes learning new information. So whether that is attending the lecture, you then spend another 20 minutes testing yourself on the information learned. So this can be via quizzes or Anki cards. And then you take a 20 minute rest and then you repeat the cycle. So in this element too, we are spacing, so having regular intervals, but we're also going a little bit slower and chunking the way that we approach our studies. You'll be really interested to know that there's been several studies done where they've looked at the retention of knowledge in medical students in second and third year by testing them on some of the material that was delivered in year one of the program. Interestingly, a second year student, without actually revisiting any of the content delivered in year one, forgot up to 33% of that content. Whereas after two years, they forgot more than 50% of that content. Another study showed us that when second year students were tested on immunology, physiology, and neuroanatomy content from year one of the program, approximately 53% of that neuroanatomy knowledge was forgotten with no reinforcement. The same studies found that medical students and residents that used spaced distribution tended to remember 40% more of the content compared to those that didn't use spaced and paced learning. So how do you do this? Well, my recommendation is that it's better to study one hour of content every day as opposed to studying eight hours in one sitting on the weekend. This is really going to help you to better encode that information into your long-term storage. Secondly, I'm not sure about you, but for me, passive strategies such as rereading lecture notes or re-listening to the lecture are not actually effective to help me to remember the information in the long term. And a way that we can address this is via retrieval practice or test enhanced learning. The research shows us that it's actually the struggle, so the cognitive struggle associated with testing yourself. So seeing how well you can pull or retrieve the information from your storage that actually leads to better retention and better overall memory as well as storage strength. So this is based on two main hypotheses. So the retrieval effort hypothesis states that the more effort it takes for your brain to be able to retrieve information, so the more effort, the greater the struggle, the more it's going to boost the overall memory. So this is where opportunities to test yourself through formative quizzes, through flashcards, are really effective for you to gauge what information is easy for you to recall, but also where your knowledge gaps are. So where do you have to go back and continuously test yourself? This then talks to the second hypothesis, that is the theory of disuse where the researchers claim that memory is divided into two components. So we have the retrieval strength, but you also have storage strength. And this theory of disuse ultimately states that it's the retrieval events 
and the pathways associated with that struggle that are going to improve the overall storage strengths. Opportunities that we then offer in the curriculum for you to be able to practice retrieval practice is through formative gamification, for instance, like Quitch, where the traffic light system helps you to identify which areas you struggle with and it encourages you to go back and revisit them using spaced repetition, but also to constantly test yourself to make sure that you can encode that information into that long-term storage. Thirdly, I want to talk about the importance of undisturbed processing. And there are various components that fall under this umbrella, but ultimately, if we're coming back to that sensory memory component, we need to be able to minimize the distractions in our learning environment. Under this category, it has been recognized that chunking your study is one of the most effective ways to encode information. One of the ways that you can incorporate chunking into your study routine is to use a method that is referred to as the Pomodoro method. And the Pomodoro method has been built into many of the apps that you can find on your mobile devices, where the premise is that you set a timer for 20 minutes of study, followed by a rest period of approximately five minutes. And the premise behind this is that it is actually the rest period after the introduction of new information into your brain that is important for your information to be transferred to long-term storage. We haven't spoken a lot about the anatomical components associated with memory, but the main structures that function to help with memory are located in the medial temporal lobe of the brain. Specifically, we have centers such as the hippocampus and the amygdala that are really important in memory. For example, the main function of the hippocampus is for declarative memory. So that is remembering facts and mem remembering events. Whereas the amygdala is more so involved in the emotional aspects of memory. So ultimately, that medial temporal lobe is going to function to assemble all of the pieces of information to then store it. So the premise is, we need time for the information to shift from the aspects of our cerebrum into the hippocampus. And the way that we achieve this is through rest. So building in those rest breaks during the course of your study, but also making sure that you get a good night's rest because this is critical for consolidation. The second thing that I'd like you to consider is handwriting versus typing. There are now numerous studies that have been conducted that show evidence that handwriting is more effective for memory retention compared to typing. And the reason for this is if we're thinking about what is involved with the process of transferring information from your head to your hand onto the page, as what is required in a written exam, for instance, the circulatory is just so much more complex and your brain has to work so much harder. So once again, that struggle is going to result in memory enhancement. So there are three components associated with writing. This then brings me to my next tip that centers around incarnational learning or otherwise as seen in my lifeboard videos, drawing to learn and the effectiveness of drawing as an encoding strategy. Drawing is also a type of deep learning or deep processing, which is going to help us to remember conceptual complex information better as well as longer. So we know that memories are stored by changing the strength of the synapse. That is, the stronger the synapses, so the greater the connectivity and the harder your brain is working, 
the better your memory is going to be. If we're looking at the components associated with drawing. So firstly, we have the elaborative stage, which is where you picture or visualize in your mind what something looks like. And this is based on prior information, such as your working knowledge of what a lion looks like based on TV shows or seeing it in real life or seeing images. Secondly, once you've visualized what it is you want to draw, there is then a motor component in terms of actually making that happen. And this is that manual process of bringing the information from the head into your hand, thinking about the type of font, thinking about the letters, thinking about how you're going to draw that representation of a lion. So we've got the elaboration, we then have the motoric component, and then finally, once you've drawn the lion, you then are going to visualize it, you're going to process, you're going to reflect, and think about how accurate that is compared to the real thing. And this is ultimately called the pictorial component. So these three components that are then involved in pulling that image from your head to your hand and onto the page, that kinesthetic learning is ultimately the most powerful way of encoding information. Yes, it is going to take longer, but in the long term, it is going to be very efficient in terms of ensuring the strength of that long-term memory. Don't just take my word for this, because obviously I love drawing, but the research shows us that students have superior retention of information when they draw as opposed to when they are simply viewing or listening to information. The final tip that I have for you involves a really important anatomical structure called the amygdala. And the amygdala is involved in the emotional linking of information. The premise is that the stronger their emotion, the stronger the memory. That is, as human beings, we are storytellers. So that means we remember things better based on stories of emotion, of the brain's ability to remember space and spatial recollections. So we can harness this power of storytelling through a learning strategy referred to as memory palaces. A memory palace is an ancient Greek way of associating new information with information and objects that you already know in your brain. And this utilizes the power of the brain to store spatial locations and their associated connections. There is a great example on osmosis of the application of memory palace to remember a list of drug classes that can lead to pancreatitis. Or in my instance, I tend to use memory palace to remember the 12 cranial nerves. This is a really useful strategy if you're trying to remember important lists of concepts. And this kind of goes alongside mnemonics, both of which are going to fall under that deep processing for long-term retention. But ultimately, a memory palace may take longer it is more complex, so it requires a lot more effort because it has to be personalized to your own prerequisite knowledge. But ultimately, it is so powerful because of the involvement of the amygdala with helping to store information in those long-term centers. So ultimately, these are my recommended learning strategies to help you to encode new information into your long-term storage so that it makes it easier for you to retrieve that information when it comes to your final exam or down the track in your role as future doctors. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. And please check out some of my other Lightboard videos that help you to break down complex anatomical concepts using a simple drawing to learn approach.